that first verse. Here we go. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this bless assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul and Lord taste the day when the pain shall be sighed the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. well, it is well with my soul. Good seeing you. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. We'll look forward in prayer. Father, we come tonight. We do thank you for the privilege we have to be able to come together tonight around your word. We would pray you allow your Holy Spirit now to bring just a complete calm and a stillness to our hearts tonight that we would be able to not just hear your word, but also be doers of your word. I pray, Father, that you'd help as we uh, have a, a great uh, a bunch of things going on all around us here this week with the various camps and things that are taking place. And we're thankful for this busy time of the year. It's also an exciting time as you've been working in the hearts of folks, and we're thankful for that. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would just kind of just take uh, this time now that we would just be able to draw out of the world for a little bit. And we pray you put a holy hedge around about us, not let Satan have any liberty or right away whatsoever. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, certainly allow all that is said and done tonight to come back to achieve your perfect will uh, in our hearts and our lives, and that you'd receive all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We'll thank and praise you in advance. We ask our precious Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And for those of you joining us online tonight, we've got a number of folks that have uh, been unable to make it uh, here this evening. And uh, so they're checking in online and will be viewing us uh, that way. Uh, first of all, you may have tuned in and said, I've got the wrong channel. No, you got the right channel. <laughs> and uh, uh, pastor doesn't usually dress down like this, uh, poor, per se. But we decided to be a little bit casual tonight because uh, Brother Ed Decker is going to be with us here in a moment. He's going to be coming and giving us a message in a little bit. And uh, I ran into him yesterday over at Fernwood at the camp where we have junior camp going on this week. And he came in to participate and help there a little bit. And so we were sitting there yesterday a little bit at the table talking and, it, and the Lord prompted me to ask him, I said, hey, Brother Decker, I'm just curious, uh, are, you know, they've got you busy here in the schedule probably this week. Uh, I said, man, it'd be nice to have you be able to come over and preach sometime. We tried, I don't know, a couple months ago to get him to come, and uh, he and his wife were on, deputy, or on tour rather for the college, for Massillon Baptist College, doing some traveling through the summer. And the one date that opened up was the day that we had Doug, Brother Doug Brandenburg here, and Brother Decker knows Brother Brandenburg quite well. And, and so I said, you know, unfortunately, we already had him booked. And, and so I said, that date's not going to work out. So let's do another time. So anyhow, a couple months fast forward now. Here we are yesterday sitting over there talking. I said, well, we need to have you come. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, I'd like to do that. I said, well, just out of curiosity, I said, are, are, you, you know, are you committed? Do they need you to do chapel tomorrow? Or what's going on? And uh, he said, no, as a matter of fact, he says, uh, I'll be doing chapel on Thursday morning and doing some help uh, other times. He says, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm free. I said, well, why don't you come and preach for us Wednesday night? So Brother Decker's here, and uh, we lined that up yesterday. Well, then he called, uh, I guess it was this morning we talked. It was this morning we talked. And he said, Brother Benny Penny, I got a problem. I thought, oh, boy, something's come up at the camp, and he's, he's going to be tied up, he's not going to make it tonight, and, and our date that we had all figured out got messed up again, you know, and, and I said, what's up, brother, and he said, well, when I left to come here, I was coming to camp, and brother Robbie Morrison said, you don't need to bring any kind of suit, because you're going to be at camp, they're just going to be wearing polo shirts, so take some of your college polo shirts with you, you'll be comfortable at camp, and you won't even need a tie, you so he said, so that's what I did. He says, and it dawned on me that uh, if, if I should need to have a shirt and tie for Wednesday night, I don't have that. I'll have to go. I said, brother, don't go out and do that. I said, just wear your polo shirt. And so I said, and to make you feel good, I'll wear one too. And so if you don't like what you see tonight, blame it on Brother Robbie Morrison. Because it was Brother Robbie who started this whole problem with Brother Decker. Wasn't a problem for Brother Decker, wasn't a problem for Camp, and it, personally it's not a problem for me either. So anyhow, uh, next time I see Brother Robbie though, but boy, I'm going to have some fun with him. Amen. So uh, anyhow, I said all that to say, um, Brother Decker will be coming and tell us a little bit about the, the work there at Maslin at the college and what the Lord's doing, and uh, some things of that nature. We'll have him share that a little bit. Uh, also with us tonight, uh, is the Florence family, and for those of you that are maybe uh, familiar in the area here years ago, uh, there's at least part of this family's familiar, amen? Uh, right, Becky? <laughs> part, some folks will be, will be, will be familiar uh, with Rebecca, uh, used to be Schaefer, Rebecca Schaefer, uh, attended the St. Hills, and um, somehow Josh found the best thing in life after salvation, and that was Rebecca. Amen? That was a good point for you to come in there, brother, and say amen. All right? Just want to, I'm helping you here. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage it a little bit. Amen? Well, anyhow, long story short, I'll let them come and tell you a little bit about their ministry and things. 
uh, I think six years now, brother. Am I correct? Six or seven? Where yet? Eight years now. My goodness, how the time has flown. Eight years, they've been missionaries to Papua New Guinea. And uh, they're home on a little bit of furlough and doing some things here in the States. And, uh, and so uh, we wanted to be able to have them come and try to have a, a date. And honestly, I, I, I told uh, Josh a little bit ago when he you know, came in the building, I said, Josh, I apologize. I said, I, I, you are on my people to call list. He called me a couple weeks ago and said, we'd like to try to come by sometime. And uh, I said, but I have been running like a, like a crazy man been out of town uh, a few different trips and so forth, and so we just didn't get a chance to set up anything. I told him I'd love to have him come and uh, spend a Sunday with us, and we'll just have another mission Sunday like we did last Sunday with uh, Brother Bob DeWitt. And those of you that know Brother Bob, we have come to know him as Baji Bob. Amen. And so, uh, praise the Lord, uh, we had a great Sunday last Sunday with that. And, uh, and so we've got some mission emphasis going on here. By the way, Massillon Baptist College is also a little bit of a mission emphasis as well. Amen. Uh, I know it's a local church ministry uh, of Massillon Baptist Temple, uh, but certainly uh, is helped by many churches that uh, use that for a mission uh, support. And, uh, and all the pastors and the different ones that are teaching there uh, are local church pastors that come and uh, give of their time. And so uh, the way that the school is supported and strengthened is by others that are help, helpful to give. And um, also, uh, the, uh, it enables the college to be tuition-free and to so forth and so on. So anyhow, uh, keeping the cost down, amen? Uh, so those things are all, all there as well. But uh, all that being said, we've got a, a few things we want to do tonight. Also, I want to give you a quick update. Uh, the young people, uh, we had uh, two weeks ago, teen camp, and I believe it was two weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago, uh, we had uh, the teenagers at camp. They had seven young people accept Christ as their Savior. When Brother Bob DeWitt was here on Sunday, he was coming back from a camp, and I'm sure you'd know where it's at, Brother Decker, but I can't remember the name, outside of Summersville, West Virginia, someplace, uh, West Virginia, yes, sir. I'm trying to remember the name. I'll get it when I don't have to think about it. But anyhow, they had 34 uh, teenagers accept Christ last week there. And this week we have junior camp going on. And uh, they had to expand to accommodate for the campers. They were finding extra cots and moving things around and doubling up kids in areas and putting counselors around and they wound up having 67 campers registered on Monday. And, uh, and so praise the Lord for what the Lord's doing there. Uh, I don't have a full report yet, but I, I've stopped in each day and checked on the kids a little bit. We've got, I think, about six kids uh, there for junior week. And uh, as I looked around, I kept noticing, uh, you know, there's one of my grandchildren. And there's another one of my grandchildren. And I looked around over here, and I, oh, there's two of our church kids. And okay, here comes another one came up, and, and I think Brother Decker might have been sitting there talking, and, and, and they all kept coming by and giving me a little hug while we were at snack time. And, and, uh, and, and I said, well, this is my grandchild, this is my grandchild, and so forth. And he said, I kind of got that idea, you know. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, here comes a couple more kids, and came over and gave me a little hug, and I said, how you doing? And and he said, is this another one of your grandchildren? And it was Lauren. She piped up and she said, no, I'm an adopted grandchild. <laughs> he said, I adopted him. So anyhow, uh, we, had, uh, we had some fun. But uh, kids are doing good. Everybody's well. And they're having a blast, a great time. And the meeting's going well. So keep praying for spiritual decisions that are taking place there. Amen. Three saved yes. Okay, bro, praise the Lord. I, I didn't get that report yet, so... Brother Decker, news right off the hot wire there, amen? Three saved yesterday, amen? And uh, what a blessing that is. So keep praying, the Lord will keep working there, amen? Very good. Well, let's do this. I'll tell you what, uh, why don't we take a, a, a pause here. Brother Josh, would you mind coming? Why don't you take a few minutes, tell us a little about, about your work and your family and where you're at. Come on up here. I'll, I'll get out of the way for a minute.
All right, good evening. My name is Josh Florence. I am from Georgia, but my sole redeeming quality is that I married a young, beautiful, sweet, talented, intelligent lady from Darlington. My 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 13 year wedding anniversary was on Monday. Yeah, it was on Monday and we had to 13 years this past Monday and so I'm blessed. And um it's not easy to find a lady who wants to be a missionary and who is willing to go to Papua New Guinea and get malaria and then get fever and then not leave. But I'm thankful that uh, God's blessed me with a godly wife. We did uh, meet when we were at Christian College. She was getting her nursing degree. I was there studying the Bible. I wanted to be an evangelist. And then at the end of our my senior year, I was invited to go on a mission trip to uh, Ivory Coast, West Africa. And it was a medical mission trip to help a missionary there. He had a hard time getting into some of the villages because they were either a staunchly Catholic, or they were some other denomination. They didn't want him to come to preach there. So he said, can I bring a doctor and some medicine? And they said, sure. So he brought uh, a, a national local doctor, and then we came with the medicine and some nurses, and also I came with them. And everybody who came through to see the nurses, get their blood pressure checked, to get uh, whatever pain medicine or whatever we had for free that was available, they had to come through and hear the gospel as well. And so I got to preach the gospel about 15 minutes at a time, about 10 people at a time, for hours and hours every day. And we saw many people get saved during that week. And that just really opened my mind and opened my eyes to what is a real evangelist. <laughs> Not a revivalist, but an evangelist, somebody who goes and preaches the gospel. And I'm just thankful uh, I get to do that. We did arrive in Papua New Guinea after uh, deputation and those things to, to start off our ministry in 2014, February. And we went into a mountainous region in the Gulf province. Um, another missionary has started a mission station there, so we went to sort of get our feet wet. It was an airplane access only, so we would fly in with a small uh, enough air airplane, like a Cessna or something like that. And then land there on a grass airstrip, hike about two hours to the mission station. We'd stay there uh, three, four, five months, and then go out for groceries, stay out for a week or two, and then come back. We lived there for one year. We learned the trade language of talk vision, helped with some of the local men that were starting churches in their villages. So I would hike and, and preach for them. They would translate for me. After I learned the trade language, then they could translate it into their their native or their uh, tribal language. After one year living there, we moved to the western province, and it's a very low-lying area, a very swampy area. And they have a big uh, river called the Fly River. It goes from the ocean all the way up to my town and then further up. But after my, that, my point where we are, that was like the water was deep enough so they could bring barges in there. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, they discovered gold in that area up in the mountains. So what they did was they used their barges to come up the Fly River, very big river. It takes one week to get from the capital city on the other side of the island up that river and drop off their heavy equipment like bulldozers and excavators and stuff. And so from there, they started digging a road through the jungle. That's about 50 miles long. From there up into the mountains. And it's really, you know, curvy. And that's where the, the gold mine was. Back in the early 90s, they started digging that out. So that town where they were dropping off the things from, from the barges that port there, uh, they called it Kyunga Town. And that's where we moved back in 2015, September of 2015. We've been living there ever since. And uh, when we first arrived, the Lord allowed us to work with one of uh, a national pastor for about three years. And during that time, we started a Bible institute and uh, helped them get a Christian school started. And then the Lord provided us about 10 acres of land outside of that town. And so we began developing that. And um, I came home on a furlough back in 2018, and three, uh, two or three of the young men that had gr graduated from the Bible Institute went up to their village up the highway about two hours, started a, a fellowship there. 
So when we got back in 2019, we helped out in the capital city with one church. A missionary had gotten sick and had to go home. We helped them to transition over to a national pastor for about seven months. Then we went back to Kyunga, helped the church in Ningram to uh, get established, buy a piece of land for them, and now they have a, a local pastor looking after them. Then we started another church in Kyunga in uh, January 2021. That's Berean Independent Baptist Church. I'm still pastoring that church. Uh, some of our Bible school students are preaching there now. And Lord willing, when we go back uh, at the end of this year, I don't know if I'll have to step back in there or if they'll be uh, able to keep, keep going with that. But um, Lord willing, we have a few Bible Institute students that are ready to, to preach. And so we're looking forward to seeing if we can help them get some more churches started uh, when we head back in this next year. But please pray for us. Um, we're at a we're at a unique time in our in our life and ministry. My kids are 11 to four years old, and uh, if we go stay for four years, then uh, Abigail is going to be you know about 16 by the time we come back, and then it won't be long before she'll be going to Bible college or whatever the Lord has for her. But it's um this might be their last chance to see some of their grandparents. Um, their great grandparents are in their 80s, and um, we have several of those that are still alive, and so it's an it's a unique time for us. We're thankful to be home, but we're also uh, definitely planning to go back, and we're excited about it. Thank you, Pastor. All right, I asked Brother Josh if uh, if anybody in the family sings, and uh, he said, "Yeah, the kids would." Be able to sing. I said we'd love to have them sing. And the good thing about it, kids, is you know what? We're just kind of a small family group here. But I, I do want to tell you though, I'm so thankful because the first thing they did when they got in the building tonight, they came up and said, "Here, Pastor, we picked a bunch of stuff out of the garden before we came tonight. There was the garden is extra. I think uh, Becky's mom, your, her garden is really producing, right?" And, uh, and, and Rebecca said, uh, this is the first time they ever got to pick anything out of the garden. I just want to thank you for giving me a couple really good tomatoes. Because if you guys are really, really bad, I'm going to throw tomatoes at you. No, no, I'm not really. I'm not going to. I'm not. You don't have to worry about anybody throwing tomatoes at you. I'm, I'm just teasing you. So, um, all right. I'm, I have a little fun with you guys. You guys go ahead and sing for us, all right? Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to sing a few ABC songs, we mm -hmm. call them. They're uh, for every letter of the alphabet. There's a verse that goes with them put to song by another family that did this, and we took it on. Okay, so we're going to just sing two of them, and then we'll sing, I think, or I love you, Lord. Uh, starting with P, put on the whole armor. One, two, sing. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, 11. What? No, no ye not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. First Corinthians 
I thank you, Lord, for all you've done. I don't deserve your love. When I was lost, you saw my need and left your home above. I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, because of Calvary. I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, your everything to me. You proved your love on Calvary. You bore my sin and shame. I live for you through all my days. I'll praise your holy name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. The of Calvary. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Your everything to me. All right. Well, I got to tell you, I love it when the Lord brings things together. None of us knew what was going to happen tonight until we got here, really. We had ideas and plans, but then the Lord kind of changed all that along the way somewhere and uh, put it all together tonight. Kimberly and I talked a few minutes before we started the service, and we had another song picked out. And uh, before they started singing, I looked over at her and I said, hey, I'm going to change the song to another number, and we kind of did that before they started singing, not knowing what you were going to sing. And uh, the number I chose to have us come and sing before Brother Decker comes is 258. And that song is, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Amen. So it just kind of goes right along with the theme that they just kind of presented for us here. And that's a blessing, kids. Thanks for singing for us. Appreciate that. Number 258. 258. Oh, how I love Jesus. If you're able to stand with us one more time, we'll invite you to do so. And then I'm going to have Brother Decker come here in just a moment. He's going to share some of the things about the ministry of Massillon Baptist College. And he is the dean of students there. Uh, anybody watching online, some of the older folks, like, you know, I'm thinking I'm ancient history. We just celebrated 40 years uh, graduation class a year ago, right, Brother Decker? This last year was 40, 41, and so we happened to go back in May, and it was for the 40th anniversary of those that graduated in 82, and uh, so it was 40 years for them. And, uh, and so I, I reminded Brother Ray Cunningham that how old he was because it was 40 years since he graduated, and he smiled and said, yeah, but you graduated a year before me, so that makes you even older. I said, yeah, that's right. So anyhow. Uh, but back in those days, uh, when we were in Bible college, of course, Dr. Cummins was uh, there as the pastor of the church. Um, Brother Larry Emery was the uh, dean of students and uh, head of the college there and so forth. Man, I, I look back, Brother Decker, and I just counted a real privilege of the years that Sherry and I were there and how God used that in our lives so immensely. And I uh, saw Brother Emery here uh, back a couple months ago told him again how much I appreciated uh, his faithfulness and the work that he did in instilling and working with young men and women to prepare them for the ministry. And uh, now many years later, Brother Decker is kind of in that position now to uh, take and do that same opportunity. And I'm sure, Brother, I'm going to say it publicly while we're talking, I'm sure there's a lot of times when you probably get frustrated, you could beat your head against the wall and, and say, man, uh, what stupidity students I have, you know, and what's going on, and how come this is... And after a while, you just wonder if it's doing any good. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always show up that semester. God, God blesses years later. And sometimes you look back and you go, boy, I'm glad I, I did it. So hope it will be encouragement to you. Don't 
Don't allow the devil to steal that victory of what he, what you're doing there for the cause of Christ. Amen. All right, let's take this song and sing it, if you would. Number 258, help me out here. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Amen. Join in on that first verse. Help me out. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, Yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, just before Brother Decker comes, I did want to take one quick minute here. Uh, to share a couple prayer requests with you. Normally Wednesday night's our prayer meeting time. We have a number of requests and stuff we would be sharing. Uh, obviously, there's a, ongoing things that we've had on our prayer list. I just wanted to quickly acknowledge, uh, continue to pray for Sky's family. Um, her Aunt Joy passed away uh, last week, and they, they were able to go to the um, funeral up in New York the other day. And Sky has since made it back, which I'm sure Joe's feeling real good about that. Amen. And uh, so keep praying for the family. Also, uh, Pastor Anderson, he and I talked. And uh, if you would put Brother Anderson on your prayer list, he has got an appointment tomorrow at 3.30. He has, those of you who have been following us, he's, we've had him here a couple times. We've helped him get to the doctor and do some things and so forth. And... Uh, he is still having some severe stomach problems, pains in his, in his guts, we'll say, okay? They had the surgery that he did a year ago, I guess, and then back in the spring and all this jazz. He has been fighting something here for about two years. They've tested him, doing all this stuff, so forth and so on. 
we went to New Jersey last week. On the way back, he was still in a lot of pain, and he got home, and he called the doctor up and said, man, I, I need, need you to check this. He says, I, I'm, I'm having pain. And supposedly the last surgery you said was going to take care of it, and I'm still I'm having pain real bad. And uh, so the doctor reviewed some of the recent tests and stuff they got going, and he went over some more things, and he said, you know, uh, why don't you go uh, to a, I, I think I want to say it's the digestive, di digestive disease specialist, I think if I got it right, and uh, we're going to check and see what's going on there. Well, they, they got a report back from that, and it said that they're concerned about his gallbladder which we said two years ago, check the gallbladder, check the gallbladder. He said they did all that. They ran dye tests and everything two years ago. Could not find anything wrong. Now they're suspecting that his gallbladder is enlarged. He may have gallstones there. And uh, so he goes tomorrow at 3.30 to, to see the doctor who may perform the surgery. And uh, it's very possible he may go in for this consultation and wind up in surgery at that point. So he said, which would be fine for him. He said, just if they would take care of this, it would be great. Uh, or it might be scheduled the next day or whatever they decide. But I told him we'd put him on the prayer list tonight to be praying for him, for wisdom for the doctors as they look at him again tomorrow at 3.30. He'll be at the Hammett Hospital up in the Erie, Pennsylvania area. Uh, if you would pray for Pastor Anderson, I know that he would immensely appreciate it. Pray that he can get some relief here. It's kind of like one of them good, bad feelings, you know, you know, it hurts right now, but if he could get that osteoscopic surgery done and the gallbladder removed, I'll bet you it's going to change his world. Amen. He'll be in a whole lot better uh, feeling. It might take a couple days of healing, but he'll, he'll find that he's doing better. So pray for brother Anderson, if you would, on, on that. He needs a lot of prayer for uh, that ongoing need there. Uh, also, uh, Rachel said peanut wasn't feeling too good today. She was just kind of laying around sleeping a lot and resting. And when she's doing that, you know something's wrong. Amen. So pray for my little granddaughter. We call her Peanut. Uh, keep her in prayer. And for Rachel, she's tending to that. Um, and continue to pray for the Vacation Bible School going on at Savannah Hills this week. Uh, Brother Ray Dombeck is there. They've been having a great week. I believe he said they've already seen, well, they, I believe he told me on Sunday they had one adult saved on Sunday at Vacation Bible School. Amen? And uh, so that's a good thing. And uh, he said that they've had a couple more saved since then. I'll wait till the end of the week. We'll get their full report on that. They have one more uh, evening tomorrow. I believe they wrap it up tomorrow night. Uh, so keep them in prayer for that. And as we already mentioned, the uh, junior camp out at Fernwood. And uh, when you get done praying for them, then there's a whole lot of other <laughs> things going on too. Amen? Let me check with you real quick. Do we have anything else? I know that, uh, Terry, we had you and Rena on the prayer list. Praise the Lord, you made it in tonight. Keep praying for Rena. She, she continues to need prayer, right? Uh, you had something to follow up on that, T Terry? Go ahead. I'm sorry, say again? Yes. Oh, no. Gloria fell. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Oh, boy. All right. Pray for Terry's neighbor, Gloria. Uh, she fell today and had a tumble, probably bruised and sore now as a result of that. So pray for Gloria. All right. All right. And Miss Pam, you had your hand up here. Pray for Miss Peggy for her breathing. And Deanna. Deanna's still kind of congested, plus William. Keep them in prayer, right? Um, Peggy, uh, doing better, but uh, trying to get adjusted to the oxygen and and the, the blood issue that they were working on, right? So keep praying for Peggy. All right. And okay, come back around here. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? So Josh, you guys have anything specific we should be praying for? I didn't get to ask you beforehand. Where are you at as far as date going back? Kind of everybody's being still. She's in Titusville. Okay, pray for Rebecca's mom. All right. She's been sick, and so let's pray for her, okay, that they'll be able to all get together and have a good family visit soon, amen? All right. I'm sure she's missing seeing the grandkids. <laughs> amen. 
All right, Miss Sky, did anybody check in with you back here on the online computer uh, prayer request or anything? You can. Okay, all right, so Deanna and uh, Nancy and Patty, Miss Patty, okay. All right, very good, ladies. We'll be praying for you all, praying for your families. Glad you're checking in. All right, very good. Well, uh, Brother Decker, why don't you come? Let me step out of the way here. I'm, I, I'm sure you'd like to maybe say a few things about the college and uh, want to give you plenty of time. Brother, whenever you're done, you know, don't worry about the clock. We're, we're here till you're done. Amen? Okay. And so whatever you got to do, you come on. Thank you, Pastor. I always warn people um, when they say, you know, don't worry about the time. I have always joked that I have the ability to take a three-point message and make a three-month series out of it. So, um, But anyway, this is for you, Pastor, so, uh, so I won't jingle it all around. You do drink coffee, right? Okay, I just want to make sure. But anyway, so uh, just a, a couple of things about um, the college course. Your pastor graduated from there, and um, as he said many years ago, and um, but um, I would ask you to do this. We don't have prayer cards, but we do have the, this brochure, and I'd ask you to take one if you would and use it like a prayer card for us. It is up to date. I put this together last year, so everything in here is uh, correct. There is a difference between um, Maslin now and what it was when Brother Minnie Penny went there. We um, we are not tuition free, haven't been for years, um, and yet um, we are uh, much less expensive than most every Bible college. Um, and so, um, of course, you know, Maslin's unique in a few ways. Number one, we are a local church Bible college, um, and uh, that makes us unique to some, some Bible colleges, which uh, have no real church affiliation specifically. Secondly, um, we give three-year bachelor's degrees. When Dr. Cummins started the college in 1973, he went to the Ohio Board of Regents and basically said, um, Jesus taught his disciples in three, three and a half years. If that was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And they said, okay, as um, long as it's in ministry. So, you know, we are not a liberal arts school. We are a Bible college. All we do is try to train young people for ministry. And so, obviously, pastoral ministry, missions. We have a relationship with BBTI and, and um, um, the Florence's. You, uh, Went to BBTI, graduated from there. If a young person goes through our college, gets a three-year degree in missions, goes to BBTI and goes through their nine-month program and graduates from BBTI, then we grant a Master of Missions, and we'll have a young lady who just graduated in May from BBTI that this next May will get her Master of Missions degree in our next graduation. And, um, and we've had um, a few young people do that now. And, um, and so... Of course, Pastor Thayer spent 11 years in South Africa, so uh, missions is a big part. Of course, during this year, we had two of our professors that died within three weeks of one another. Um, Dr. Gary Forney who was the executive director of All Points Baptist Missions, and uh, he went to heaven on December 10th, and then uh, Pastor Brother Terry Wyrick went to heaven on January 4th, um, and so... Uh, but the students handled that well. We also had two students that their dad was a pastor in New York, passed away three weeks after that. And so it was um, a little bit of a different um, semester. But um, we will miss um, Dr. Forney and Brother Wyrick, but God's raised up some other men. Um, another uniqueness along with being three-year Bible college. And, of course, we also have, I just mentioned, that we have a one-year Bible certificate, and I try to encourage all young people you know, if you think you're going into the secular world, you ought to go a year for Bible college and make sure you get your feet on the ground really well because your faith's going to be tested and challenged by this world. And the, the more wicked the world gets, the more they try to challenge our faith. Then we just restarted this last year, our two-year associates in office management. We had our first two young ladies graduated with their two-year associates degree in May. And uh, this next year... We are redeveloping uh, uh, teaching. We don't give an elementary and secondary education degree because we do not teach math, science, uh, history, other than Acts and church history and Baptist history. Um, but 
we are developing specifically how to teach. I've had probably 15 to 18 pastors in the last two summers call me and say, I need Christian school teachers. They don't have to have an elementary, secondary education degree, but they have to have a degree. And they need to be able to teach. And having pastored for 39 years and had Christian schools most of that time, I know what it is to hire graduates who have elementary, secondary education degrees who can't teach, who know how to do lesson plans and bulletin boards and that kind of thing. But when it comes to the actual classroom uh, teaching, uh, my wife had to take time, numerous times, to teach them how to teach. So that's what we're going to be working on is developing that, teaching them how to teach, how to um, have tests and measurements, evaluate how students learn, are they learning what you're, what you're teaching. And we are going to be using the, the Christian school. We'll be able to use uh, um, student teaching uh, practice over in the Christian school, and I hope to develop that. So we're redeveloping that program um, now. And so then, as Pastor um, Manny Penny said, um, all of our professors, men, uh, with the exception of one, are either uh, currently pastors or retired or retreaded pastors. Um, and so um, it, it, we're not teaching from book knowledge without practical knowledge. We're teaching young people. Um, Brother Ron Royalty, who pastored for years in Poland, Ohio, and just retired at 74 years of age in um, March, will be teaching for us this year. He's come on board. We have a couple of other men in their 70s with many years of experience. In a small college like we are, I, I told the students, you have um, over 400 years of pastoral experience teaching you every week. Um, and uh, so, and then we have one man who has a, a ministry to churches, but he is a CPA. And so he teaches church finance and legal policies and, um, and he has a ministry helping churches make sure they're set up properly and legally, uh, financially, and all of that. And so he teaches um, uh, those things in the church, in the college. And then, of course, we have some ladies' classes um, and computer classes in our office management. We teach all the current Microsoft business uh, programs, QuickBooks as well. And then they work in the church office or the college office or the Christian school office um, a number of hours, at least 60 hours in the second semester. And so um, you would uh, take that brochure, pray for us. And then the other thing, I guess, would be if you saw uh, in there, um, it would say that if a student came uh, for an entire year and they um, lived in the dormitories, uh, room, board, tuition, everything. It, and then when you put the books in, it would cost them around $51 or $5,200 for a year, not for a semester, but for an entire year. Most Bible colleges, it's that much for at least a semester. And so uh, the way we ha are doing that is we have about 30 churches that support us on a regular basis. I had a call today from a pastor, and I'm scheduled to preach for him now uh, two weeks from Sunday uh, over uh, in Ohio, and he said, one of the things I want my church to do is become regular in supporting the college. I was just in North Carolina, met a pastor for the first time, presented the work, and he said, after the service, do you let churches support the college? I said, no, absolutely no. I said, yeah, you know. He said, well, I'm going to talk to my deacons about taking, because I, we want to we invest in those who are investing in people being prepared for the ministry. So um, it's churches that help us. And then Massillon Baptist Temple obviously invests um, substantially in the ministry. And so uh, pray for us. Pray that the Lord will bring in the students. We're, uh, we don't have a, a near as many students as they had back in the 80s. Um, but we've had a very good group of young people. Uh, we graduated four young men, two young ladies in May. And, um, and looking forward to another good group uh, coming in. And so just pray the Lord will direct young people there who are serious about serving the Lord and trying to prepare for him. You know, we're not about, um, I, I say this and, in, in, you know, um, not trying to be critical, but we're not about all the foo-foo and fluff stuff of tr the trying to draw p kids in by uh, how much games they can play or how many, um, you know, activities we're trying to get young people to come serious about serving the Lord and trying to prepare them. So, Pray for us if you would take one of those brochures, if you would, and we appreciate that. 
there are a couple things on the table that we have that um, are, are for sale. I just mentioned them quickly. But this book is by Dr. Cummins. He wrote it in 1973, the same year he started the college. We celebrate 50 years this spring. Um, but he saw the argument coming. Um, first 50 years of um, the 20th century was argument between modernists and liberals versus fundamentalist conservatives, whether the Bible even was God's word. Um, he began to see a battle coming over the question of, so which Bible? And um, so it's, it's kind of his personal walk through determining that the King James Bible, God's preserved word for English-speaking people, and that when you held this Bible in your hands, you held God's word in your hand, and you could... You could believe it and, and believe it confidently that it is God's word, not that it just contains God's word or some of God's words are in there somewhere um, or whatever, uh, like so many uh, take that approach. And so it, it's not a deep theological, technical book. It's a personal walk. And then just some practical things about, should I believe that a man who was on a major translation board who rejected the deity of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, and the necessity of the shed blood of Christ, can I believe that he was going to give me a good Bible? The answer is no. And so he just walks through that. Um, we sell that for $5. That's almost exactly what we pay for it. We're not trying to make money off it. I'm trying to, I've been pushing it all this year because I'm trying to put tools in people's hands. And it may be something you have a family member or a friend and they say, why you use that all that hard language so hard to understand? And it's really not. Um, there's some, some simple uh, rules that would help you greatly, but, but we need to stay true to the Word of God. So that's, that's there. Um, the pulpit echoes. Um, uh, Y'all may know some of those guys. Of course, so Jeremy McLean is Dr. Cummins' grandson. He pastors Harvest Baptist in Greenville. Uh, Brother Troyer is also a Maslin grad. And um, he pastors in Greenville, Pennsylvania as well. And then Brother Brian Lotz in, in Butler, Pennsylvania now. And, um, and so um, those three preachers sing together, and um, Pastor Thayer asked us to put that on the table. There's one other thing that's on that table, and that's another CD, but it's not for sale. We just, because it's not, we didn't record it professionally. It's just available for a love offering. It all goes to the college, whatever it is. Um, this is me and my wife and my youngest son. Um, I was preaching here. He was the pastor of Grandview Pines Baptist Church in uh, Millbrook, Alabama. I was preaching his missions conference, I think somewhere in 2012, something like that. And, um, and he said, come on, Dad, let's do some mission songs. Um, and so my wife got to the piano, and he would go back to the back and punch record and run down here, and we'd record a song. He'd go back and punch pause, and, and we record him that way. Uh, but he was a computer tech, and so he um, could um, do some work on it. They're a little bit closer together. Sometimes there's only two or three seconds where the next song starts, you know, not, unlike the ones that you buy. Um, it's still good quality. Um, the, the fifth song on here is entitled, Do You Let Me See This World? It is a song that my son's son sang at his own funeral three and a half years ago. He died of a flu-related heart attack three days after Christmas in 2018. And um, two weeks before his 36th birthday and three weeks before his 12th anniversary as the pastor there. And so um, um, it's, it's there. It's just available for an offering. And so um, if that can be a blessing to you, that's up to you. All right, sir. Say it a little slower. Okay. Um, he said go back and say it slower. Um 2018, December 27th, we arrived in Millbrook, my wife and I, or actually late night 26th, 27th, we spent the day with my son and his wife, um, getting ready to have Christmas with them, but also getting ready for a birthday party because his youngest son turned four that day, and so we had a birthday party that night on the 27th of December, 28th of December, we had our Christmas with them, um, and we left there about 3 o'clock our time. I was pastoring in West Virginia. I needed to get back um, for that Sunday. And eight hours after we left, he was dead of a flu-related heart attack. I pastored on the Mississippi Gulf Coast when Hurricane Katrina hit. And uh, 
both of us got staph infection really bad after that. It never got out of his system. And the flu of 2018, particularly in 25 to 40 year olds, if there was a, any kind of bacterial infection in the system, like a staph infection or whatever, that flu was combining with that, producing myocardial infarction given a heart attack. And so he died of a flu related heart attack um, at 35 years old. And um, his wife and six kids are still in the same church, um, still serving the Lord. Um, most of them are doing very well. And, um, and so, um, so it's, it's a special uh, CD for us. When COVID hit, the, the college hadn't recorded anything in years. And um, when I f first preached the missions conference, I was preaching the missions conference at Massillon in 2018. That's when Pastor Thayer asked me to come as the dean of the college, and we had given him one of these CDs. And um, when COVID hit, he said, let's just make that available to the church family because we didn't have an end of the year conference. We didn't have an end of the year offering to help on some of the projects college wise. And so we just stuck it out, made it available to the church family. And, and uh, my wife and I had been singing quite a bit at church. And, and so uh, church family was very, very gracious. I, I think the folks at Maslin probably um, gave offerings totaling between three and four thousand dollars just taking CDs and um, and so um, when we started traveling I've only been in, in Maslin on Sunday I think three Sundays since January maybe four and um, the pastor said stick it on the, the college table and so that's it, it's there so if you think it might be a blessing you can use that I'll um pastor told me um sing a song if I wanted to, I'd have to do it a capoco. But um, um, I, I just, just a couple of verses here, and I'll take you to Second Peter chapter, excuse me, First Peter chapter 5, and I will um, not go through everything that I could, just try to give you some simple thoughts. Because I know, as uh, he mentioned, Sky, her family going through, you know, the loss of a loved one. I know that pastor said to me yesterday, that Monday will be five years since your wife went to heaven. Um, my son's been gone. In the last four and a half years, my father died, my youngest son died, my mother died, my oldest brother died. Um, so I'm now the oldest living decker of all the clan because my dad was an only child. So that's a sobering thought. And, um, you know, but um, regardless, we have plenty to be grateful for. This is a familiar song, but I think it runs with this verse. Um, Ron Hamilton just wrote years ago, God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servants and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long in darkness. He giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the master that day then peace came and tears fled away now i can see testing comes from above god strengthens his children and purges in love my Father knows best, and I trust in His care. Through 
purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Um, it's interesting if you were to take the time, if we were to take the time tonight to go through the five chapters of 1 Peter, you would find the word suffer or suffering or some variation of that word, but mostly suffer or sufferings. It's 16 times. Seven times it is in specific relationship to Christ's suffering for you and I. But nine times it is dealing with the suffering that you and I go through in this life. And so, as he brings us to chapter 5, he says, beginning in, in verse 5, if I could start there with me, with you in 1 Peter chapter 5, says this way, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And then he closes that thought by saying in verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. Let me pray and I'll just give you some simple thoughts about that verse of verse 10. He said, the God of all grace. Father, thank you for the evening, the privilege to be here. Thank you for the Florence family being here and the ministry you are using them to reach people. Lord, halfway around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's because of your grace that you saved us and it's the same grace that reaches into every heart and every life regardless of the country, the language, the culture, the color of skin. Lord, you care about every man, woman, young person, boy and girl. And I pray that you would bless and remind us, Lord, that many times there are things that come in our life and you mean them for good. Our enemy would love to use them to turn us from you. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us wisdom to see that, Lord, you have all the grace that's necessary to help us through. And so I pray you bless now the next few minutes in Jesus' name. Amen. I just try to shorten the introduction here, but I would simply say to you that grace has always been the basis by which God has dealt with man. It's always been grace. Someone says, oh no, grace is just a New Testament principle. No, it's not. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And even when you got Adam and Eve in the garden and the Lord came uh, in the cool of the evening, looking to walk with Adam and Eve once again in the garden, and Adam has willfully sinned. Eve was deceived, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And he's hiding from God, and the Lord comes and says, Adam, where are you? I asked the young people earlier today, was that because God didn't know where he was? Obviously he did. He needed Adam to get honest about where he was. And what he did. The truth is, no one ever gets saved without getting honest about their con condition, without getting honest about sin. The truth is, the Lord came to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And, um, and Adam uh, is hiding, and, 
And the Lord has to get him to get honest. And, and the Lord said, why are you hiding? The Lord knew the answer to that question too. Can I say this? The Lord knows the answers to your questions too. Sometimes he asks us questions or sometimes he brings about in our lives questions that we need to ask. I would say this to you. I, I've heard people say over the years, it's never right to ask God why. Can I say this? Number one, that's not biblical. Number two, if you don't ask questions, you can never get answers. Now, God doesn't owe me any answers, and He doesn't have to answer me. Particularly, He doesn't have to answer me the way I want Him to answer. But the truth is, if God's trying to teach me something, then what I have to do is have a teachable spirit. And if I have a teachable spirit, then I must be asking God, Lord, why is this event in my life? What are you trying to do with that? And, um, and many times the answers will come from his, his word and God will give us guidance and direction and understanding. Um, the, the thing I've tried to emphasize to people is not wrong to ask God why. It's determined by how you ask him. If you ask God with a desire for God to show you and work in your life, I believe God's pleased by that. If you ask God why, because you're accusing God of having done something wrong or not done something that you like and you're trying to accuse God, then it's wrong to ask God, why did you do this? I heard that after Hurricane Katrina. I heard people complaining to God, why did you do that? I'm serving you and you let my house get destroyed by that hurricane. Who do you think? I had somebody say this. Who do you think you are, God? Can I answer that? God. You know, and so um, I think we do have to be, be careful, but the truth is God does want to teach us some things. And one of the things I think that Paul said here, or excuse me, Peter, not Paul, but Peter said in the last part of verse 9, he said, I want you to understand, you're going to have to be steadfast in the faith because your brethren are going through the same things that everybody else in this world is going through. You ever hear somebody say, oh, just get saved. It'll take care of all your problems. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You know, getting saved doesn't remove all your problems. The truth is it puts a whole different target on you. Now you have an enemy walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Now he's not just out to keep you deceived. Now he wants to destroy and devour you. Jesus made that clear in John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so Jesus made it very clear, you're going to have to be sober. You're going to have to stay on guard, be vigilant, because you have an adversary. And he's not out to just distract you or discourage you or, or, or um, you know, not just defeat you. He's out to destroy you. And, and, and here's the thing, once you're saved, he can't take your soul to hell. We're safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're secure. He gave us eternal life, everlasting life. That will never change. So the next best thing he can do is destroy our testimony, our walk with God. And many times, and I've seen this probably over the last 20 years, um, more than the first 20 years of my ministry, but I've seen people who have gotten bitter at God because of circumstances that come. And instead of those circumstances drawing them close to God, it's driven them from God. Instead of those trials and struggles and suffering making them better, it's made them bitter. Instead of drawing them in closer fellowship, it's driven them farther away. And that was because they made a choice to do that. Not because God desired that. I remind you that James chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible said that draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. The truth is I'm as close to God tonight as I want to be. Because God left me drawing nigh in my, in my responsibility. He promised this, the, the closer I choose to come to Him, He will in response come closer to me. So if I draw nigh, then He responds and comes closer. So I'm as close as I choose to be. Sometimes that's a sobering thought. But can I say this? Salvation doesn't prevent us from having... Uh, the struggles and, and battles in life, we understand that um, when it comes to grace, grace is what saved us, and uh, the, that's clear from so many verses 
you know, Ephesians 1, 7, he said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. 2, 8, and 9 of Ephesians, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we understand that saving grace is the unmerited favor of God, that God gives us something that we do not deserve. That is the forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven one day. His mercy, someone said, keeps us from getting what we do deserve, hell. And His grace gives us what we do not deserve, heaven. But may I say, grace doesn't stop once you get saved. The Bible is clear that we, we, grace is where we live, that we're to grow in grace, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. He said in uh, 2 Peter 2.2, 2, uh, as new, or 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Well, the way we grow according to uh, first, 2 Peter 3.18 is by His grace. Um, we can talk about his grace, but I would tell you that in salvation, grace is an ad- God's divine enablement that helps us to be what he wants us to be. Paul said this, I am what I am by the grace of God. It's God's grace that helps me grow. It's God's grace that strengthens me. It's God's grace that sustains me. It's God's grace that instructs me. Matter of fact, Titus chapter 2 reminds us that grace is even our teacher. For he said in chapter 2 and verse 11, um, and my mind just went blank occasionally, it does that, has nothing to do with age. Unfortunately, um, um, Brother Minnie Penny's daughter reminded me last night that I am slightly older than your pastor. So um, every once in a while I have... um, uh, my, my brain takes a vacation. But verse 11 of Titus 2 says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So grace becomes our teacher. Grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. By the way, peculiar doesn't mean weird, okay? But it does mean we are different. And we ought to be different. The problem today is we have Christians trying to be just like the world when the truth is we ought to be so different that the world knows they need a difference and the difference is what we have or who we have. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out. You trod under the foot of men. You're the light of the world. The city of the sun on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, stick it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's not about people seeing us. It's about people seeing the one who is in us and him being glorified and drawn, because I can't save anyone. But Jesus can save everyone that will come to him by faith and by his grace. But let me just simply remind you this, that 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 grace that God has provides everything we need to live this life, to live it in a godly way. 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about that. And, um, And then God provides... Unfortunately, we have, you know, a a large swath of people today who want to basically teach that grace is licensed to live our lives um, loosely and for self. And and they've made it almost licensed to live. You know, we're saved by grace, so once you're saved, doesn't matter how you live, God doesn't care. Oh, yes, He does. He certainly does. And grace is not licensed to live loosely or for self. Grace gives us the liberty to live for the Savior. Grace gives me the longing and the love that I should have to live for the Savior. It is the power. Grace is the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit who is in us once we get saved to live this life in a way that honors and glorifies God and tells a lost world that Jesus Christ makes a difference in us. It is that grace 
that brings maturity in our lives and causes us to not just learn, but we live, learn to live for, lean upon, and love God more because of that grace. In verse 10, he says this, but the God of all grace. So he reminds them about being humble in verse 5 and verse 6. He reminds them where you can go when you have difficulties and burdens and challenges and, and struggles. He said, you know what? You can bring all your cares and cast them on Him. Casting all your care upon Him. Why? For He careth for you. Can I tell you, I don't know what you're going through now. I don't, I don't know the burdens that you're carrying, but can I say this? God does. And what He says to every one of us is, hey, bring it to me. Give it to me. I can take it. Now, you can put enough on me. I can't take it. Talking to somebody, and they were talking about today the stress of the ministry up in years, and he said, it just has gotten more than I can handle now at the age I am. The stress of the ministry is just kind of, it began to affect me physically. Can I say that? That's true for all of us. There are times when stress and problems and burdens and heartache overwhelm us. By the way, if you've ever heard someone say, well, you know, the Bible promises God never put more on you than you can bear. No, it, the Bible doesn't say that. That context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is dealing with sin because he's dealing with the nation of Israel coming out of, the, of Egypt and in the promised land and the sin they committed. And then he said, there hath no temptation, talking about sinful temptation, has taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the apostle Paul said this, he was in such affliction and such difficulty that he despaired of even life. I guess if the Apostle Paul was in a state of despair, I guess you and I can understand some of that too. The Apostle Paul knew when it was. Matter of fact, in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was burdened with a thorn in the flesh. Now we can conjecture about what it was, but the Bible doesn't tell us. And I think God didn't tell us for a reason, because since it's not a specific thing listed, anything applies. Whatever that is, we can bring it to God. But Paul was convinced of this. If God would take away that thorn, he could serve him so much more effectively and do so much more for him. And so three times he, he beseeches God, he begs God, he, thrice. I don't think that just means three times he said, oh God, please take this away. I think it means three times he fasted and prayed and, and spent hours pleading with God and, and giving God all the reasons why he felt like if he would just take that away, he could be so much more effective. And the Lord's answer was, no. What? Yeah. Verse 9, he said, my grace is sufficient. for thee. Verse 8, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Lord said to Paul, no, what you need to understand, Paul, if I let you be strong, you'll think you got that done. But I've got things to do that you need to always know I'm the one who did it, not you. And the only way that will take place, you're going to have to be weak and know that it's my strength and my grace that provided the answer, the help, the solution, the miraculous events. It's not about you, Paul. It's about me. So you must understand my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And the apostle Paul then went on and said, I will therefore gladly rejoice in my infirmity. He said, you know what? Thank God for this thorn because God's going to prove himself the one strong instead of me. And I tell you, sometimes God puts things on us that we have to look and say, Lord, this is more than I can bear. And the Lord looks back and says, that's what I needed you to see. That you can't take care of this, but I can. Sometimes we bring our burdens to an altar. and We say, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't bear up under this. Lord, please help me. 
But the problem is when we get up, sometimes we pick the burden right back up and carry it with us. We don't leave it there. We don't really cast it on him. I remember a story about a man who um, worked, um, had several children many years ago, and, and he, he worked in a factory, and, and um, they, their vehicle was broken down. So he started getting a ride with a man to work, and, and he would go to work. And every night, um, you know, they, he'd be worn out and tired and filthy, and I think he worked in a, a, a steel plant, you know, and um, he comes home, and the man noticed that every night he would walk up to the porch and he would stop. There was a bush by the, the, the porch, and he would reach over and he would take a hold of, of some leaves and he'd just stand there for a minute, rubbing the leaves. Then he'd put a smile on his face, walk up the steps and walk in the house. And he watched him do that night after night after night. And finally he said, look, i got to ask you something. I've been watching you do this night after night after night after night. He said, what, what are you talking about? He said, you walk up and you grab a hold of that bush and you, you rub on the leaves and then put the smile on your face and walk in the house. What, what are you doing? He said, oh, that's my burden bush. I've determined that my children don't need to put up with my burdens when I get home. They need me to be their daddy and know that everything's okay. So I just walk to that bush and I say, Lord, I'm just giving you all these burdens. I'm putting them on the burden bush again tonight because I can't go in here and have a good attitude and a good spirit trying to carry them all. So I'm just putting them on you. So I'm leaving them on this bush tonight. And he said, and then I walk inside. And if I need to, the next morning I can pick them up at the bush. You know, can I tell you... Um, that's what a good old-fashioned author's for, just come and we can. But you know what? You can do that anywhere. Isn't that what he said in Hebrews chapter 4? That let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. He said, look, this i got grace at this throne. You can come right into my presence, and I've got mercy and grace for your need. So you can cast it all on him because he cares for you. He reminds them about our enemy and and the afflictions that we we go through in this world. But verse 10, he said this, and I'll be very quick and I'll be done because I looked up at the clock. I'm sorry, Pastor, I still looked at it. He said this, but the God of all grace, the God of all grace, that means all the grace you and I need and grace for all that we face, God has it. And you can get as much grace as you need, and I can get as much grace as I need, and God's not going to be any less uh, uh, prolific of having all the grace available. You know, he's got enough for every one of us. And he said, the God of all grace. I would just tell you, there, there's the provider of grace. Do you need some grace tonight, the struggles and challenges you're facing, burdens, maybe heartache? <laughs> Um, there are th sometimes there are things we can tr control. Other times there are things we cannot control. The Ferguson's, um, Brother Matt Ferguson is a graduate of Maslin, and he pastors Bible Baptist the Temple there in Campbell, Ohio. Um, and there, it's their church that owns Camp Fernwood now, Fern Fernwood Christian Camp, and they're out there working. Well, this week. There at the camp, it's not just Brother and Mrs. Ferguson, but Mrs. Ferguson's dad and one of her sisters. Over the 4th of July weekend, her mother and two of her sisters and some couple of grandkids were up at Niagara Falls. And they had spent the day, to, and dad, they'd spent the day together and, and been at Niagara Falls and all that kind of thing. They're walking away from Niagara Falls, and, and they, she just, Brother Ferguson says she had a smile on her face the whole day. They'd taken all kinds of pictures. They're walking away from the fall, and she just stopped, smiled, kind of cocked her head, had a massive heart attack. Now, there was a, a, a heart surgeon 
from the local area that was right there by her, and then another um, trauma physician that was just yards away, and both of them came over, began to do CPR, all that, and they you know, got her heart beating, all that kind of thing, but she, she only lived, lived about three days on machine, you know. And yet, um, her husband has been there fixing food for the juniors from your church this week. And his wife has not even been gone a month. Yesterday, they were rolling out pizza dough. His wife and him used to do all the pizza dough for camp during that week. They would, they would make it, and then they would freeze it, and then they would pull it out and, and make the pizzas. And so he said, I just didn't get to the place where I could try to make it on my own, at least not this year, maybe next year. We had to go out and buy dough. You know. How could he be there? How, how, could, how could Tina be there? Can I tell you? It's called grace. It's the grace of God. So God is the provider of grace. So, hey, just remember, we can, we can go before the provider anytime and ask. When he said in, in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need. We always, almost always make that in relationship to money and context. It does have to do, I believe, with missions giving, to be honest with you. But the truth is, um, if I put Hebrews 4 and, and Philippians 4 together, I can come before the, the throne and find help in my time of need. And God doesn't just say it's monetary need. Whatever that need is, he has the help and he has the grace because he's the provider. But he goes on and says this, not only is he the provider of grace, but I see the, the purpose of grace. He said this, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. And I tell you, there are times when God allows difficulty and suffering in our lives so that he can get glory and people can see Jesus in us. Ron Hamilton, you know, right now, Ron Hamilton is um, probably before this calendar year, he will probably be gone. He's in uh, Alzheimer's and, and his mind is virtually gone. Um, and just s simple um, and being cared for. But you know, he wrote some tremendous songs. And one of them he wrote about his father year, years ago. And it said this, I saw Jesus in you. I saw Jesus in you. And the words you said, and he wrote that song about the fact that as he watched his father, he didn't just see his dad, he saw Jesus in his dad. Can I tell you, that's what this world needs to see. They need to see Jesus in us. Being that light on a candlestick is not that we get credit, it's that he gets glory. And so he said, he's called us the purpose of his eternal glory. Have you ever watched a child of God go through some enormously, can I tell you, Pastor, five years ago, you went through enormously dark, difficult times. And I promise you there were people who looked at you and said, how can you do that? How are you even making it through this? I, can have, I, I got that answer. I wasn't even here. It's called grace. Now, some well-meaning person probably said something like this to you over the last five years. You just need to get over it. Can I say this? There are things in life you're not going to get over. What you will do is get through it by the grace of God. Because His grace is sufficient. And His purpose is that He get glory. And a world looks on and watches when we go through very difficult times as God's people and we lean upon Him and His grace meets our need and, and we keep the right attitude and the right spirit and the world looks and says, how in the world can you do that? And I got back to Alabama as we began to make preparations for my son's funeral. We knew that his church, a little bit larger than this, was not going to be large enough to hold the crowd. They were already filling it up with their church people. And um, he had been a chaplain with the local police department for the last two years before that. The police department um, 
notified me that they were going to give a, a full police department honors burial with flag draped cock, cock casket and officers at the head and foot of his casket and they would bring him in through an officer's procession and carry him out that way and all of that and um, so God just began to put things together the local high school said you know what you can use our gymnasium free of charge they set it all up they set a platform done nicely had a big cross right behind me where and so somebody began to ask me so who's preaching your son's funeral? And I said, I am. And they said, how are you going to do that? And I said, I have no clue. Except for the grace of God. His favorite song? He started off with it tonight. One of the families in his church, an Air Force pilot, stood over here, they'd set up a small piano, electric piano, and they sang, It Is Well With My Soul. I looked out and people are out there, they're singing along. So I just got up and they got done and I said, you know what? That was Jared's favorite song. We're just going to all sing it again. And I just, we're all going to sing it. And we sang, It Is Well With My Soul. And, and the service, the chief of police spoke for a few moments about five minutes, ten minutes, and Brother um, Mark Holmes, missionary in Nigeria, Jared would go to Nigeria every August and spend two and a half, three weeks in Nigeria, and there was a Nigerian pastor at his funeral there at, in the high school, and Brother Mark Holmes was back on furlough. Brother Mark spoke and spoke about all that Jared had helped them do and set up over in Nigeria. Um, my son-in-law, who's a pastor in Indiana, spoke for a few moments. My oldest son, who pastors in northern Alabama, spoke. And then um, I spoke. The service went for about two hours. Um, and, and, and God got me through. I broke down once just for a, a short period of time. But um, God got us through that. Someone said that um, the live stream we were doing had more than 4,000 people watching while it was, the service was going on. I don't know what all God did. Um, but I tell you, the only way I made it through was the grace of God. And I just say that to say we have a God who is a provider of grace, but the purpose is that God get glory. We literally, they had put Jared's death um, on the M Montgomery, Alabama news. And they'd come up and, and videoed. One of his men was the emergency management director for the state of Alabama. And so they, they had him on the camera, and then they asked me to say something and, and, and all that. Well, that same reporter came back to his funeral. And after the funeral, that reporter came up to me, this um, uh, black reporter, and he came up to me, tears running down his face, threw his arms around my neck and said, Brother, I've never seen anything with as much grace and peace as that in my life. What a testimony to the glory of God. And I'm glad I got to put it on the news. You know. And he has stood there weeping and hugged his neck and thanked him for that. But can I tell you, that's what it was about. It was about God getting glory. And sometimes God puts you and I through some things so that our life can show a lost world, that we have a Savior who can give us grace to handle our situations a whole lot different than the world. We don't need pills and, and booze and everything else to get through. We have a God who can get us through. I would just tell you, we have the promise of, of his presence in that. He said that after you have suffered a while, God never promises to keep us absent from suffering, but he said, matter of fact, in, in verse 19 of chapter 4, he said this, Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God, Commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. There are times when God allows suffering in our lives because that is His perfect will to write a testimony 
to the faithfulness of our God and His goodness and grace. If we can tap into that grace that's available, we can testify to this lost world what a great God we have. One of the songs my wife and I sing almost everywhere we go is a song that says, God's been good in my life. Um, and he has, no matter what we've gone through, he's, he's still good. I would just tell you the very last thought, and I'm done. The product of grace is this. What does that grace produce? He said, it will make you perfect. That doesn't mean sinless. It means fully grown, mature. Those sufferings and tapping into God's grace that's available will grow our faith. It will grow our testimony. God will be glorified. It, it make you perfect, mature you, um, establish. The word establish just simply means to set fast in the right direction. It, it, he said that grace will keep you going the right direction and, and stable when everything around you is going crazy. I don't know if you've ever been in the midst of a hurricane. Um, I got tired of hurricanes. That's why we moved up from the Mississippi Gulf Coast. But, you know, but can I tell you, if you've been in the, in the midst, I'll never forget 1998, Hurricane George came through and came right over where we live. So in the middle of that, 115 mile an hour winds, all of a sudden it stops, get totally quiet. One of my sons opens the door, walks outside. You can see the stars, the moon, everything. The sky is perfectly clear. And he said, Dad, it's over. I said, no. This is not good. This is the eye of the storm. We've only caught the front half. we got the back half to go. And um, my wife said we would never do that again because things go bump in the night. You know, and it was night and tornadoes all around us and trees down everywhere and all of that. But can I tell you, even in the midst of all of that, can I tell you, the storms blow. We, we don't have to be shaken. Jesus talked about that, building your house upon the rock, the right foundation, the right faith. He said, establish, strengthen. The only way you get your faith to get stronger is it has to be exercised. Peter's faith was exercised when he stepped out of the boat in the midst of the storm. Jesus didn't stop the storm for Peter to walk on the sea. Jesus just invited him to come. He had to exercise faith to get out of the boat. I know we can criticize him, but two, three cheers for Peter. He's the only second person who walked on water. You know, he got out of the boat. He exercised that faith. And you and I have to too. And it will strengthen us. Look, when, you, when you've had God bring you through some dark, difficult days, and you get through the other side of that, and you look back and know the goodness and grace of God brought you through. Then when another trouble comes your way, you know what it says? I know what God's going to do because He's done it before. And He's faithful. He doesn't change. With him is no variables, neither shadow of turning. So I know He's going to get me through again. He said, it'll establish, strengthen, settle you. To settle you means to put you down on that solid foundation and, and where our house is built firmly upon him. Faith grows, but faith grows in difficult times. Matter of fact, just this thought and I'm done. But do you know there's only two things that the Gospels record Jesus marveled at? When it uses the word marveled, that Jesus marveled. Only two things. He marveled at faith and he marveled at unbelief. And usually the faith he marveled at was a woman who had an issue of blood who reached out and just touched the hem of his garment. And he marveled at faith. He marveled at the faith in many cases. It was those who were simply exercising faith in him to do something miraculous. Usually the, the faith, the, the unbelief that he marveled at was his own disciples, the one closest to him. But he used those opportunities to build their faith. And after his resurrection and after his ascension, obviously their faith got built sufficiently because 
they actually accomplished that, that responsibility of taking the gospel. They turned Jerusalem upside down with their doctrine. When they got to Antioch, it said they turned the world upside down. And they didn't have cars, planes, internet, radio, television, nothing that we have. And yet they did it because of faith. But it wasn't that their faith was never tried. God built it. And so I just simply tell you, hey, we're serving a God of grace. Whatever it is, or whatever you're, you're going to go through, just remember back, you know what? That preacher said, God's the God of all grace. And so that's who I need to rely upon, tune into, tap into his grace. And, and he'll get us through if we let him. Father, thank you for the evening. Thank you for the privilege to be here, the patience of your folk, people. And yet, Lord, we're, we're in a day when so many folks going through challenging times. And Lord, we need you. We need your grace and your goodness. And I thank you that you're always there. You have more than we need to meet our needs. But Lord, you want to use us to make a difference. You want to write a testimony in our lives to a lost and dying world as well as to a, a, a group of people who profess to know you but Lord are away from you. You want to write a testimony of your grace and your goodness in our lives that you might be glorified, that they might be helped because they can see how you've helped us. So I pray you'd help, Lord, meet needs as only you can. May we learn how, Lord, to truly cast our cares on you, knowing that you really do care. Lord, thank you for loving us tonight. Thank you for the grace you've already provided. You continue to give. And Lord, I thank you in advance for the grace that you'll provide for us, for the challenges and struggles that come in the days that lie ahead. May we stay true to you as you are to us. Lord, we love you. We talked about that tonight. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Decker. I appreciate the message. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, let's keep our heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. And uh, as we wait upon the Lord for just a moment, ask you to be in prayer. And uh, seek the Lord, ask Him what He'd have you to do. Certainly, maybe it might be a need tonight that you need to come and uh, bring that to the altar, as Brother Decker was saying earlier in the message. The altar is here to be able to come talk to the Lord. Certainly, you need to pray. You have a burden tonight. Don't want you to go out feeling burdened. And maybe you have a loved one you need to pray for, whatever it may be. Uh, if you're here and you're not sure of that saving grace that Brother Decker talked about at the beginning there, you know, praise the Lord that for by grace are you saved through faith. He'll, uh, he's willing to save you, and uh, he, he can uh, give you that saving grace tonight. What a blessing that would be. Maybe you just need to uh, have some strength tonight, and uh, maybe you just need that little extra grace. Amen. Whatever it is, I, I, I'm not sure what it may be tonight, but the Lord may be uh, challenging your heart but we want to certainly be encouragement to you. And if we can come and, and pray together, the altar's open, you come. We'll be glad to join with you here in prayer. And uh, I'd like to just uh, encourage you to go on and to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord too. Amen. Well, let's pray and ask you just to meet the, the need here. And you, you be obedient to the Lord. Let the Lord speak to your heart. Father, we ask you now to just bless the invitation and to have your will and way. We'll thank you here. As we continue to wait, you, you come. A songwriter says, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Maybe it might be tonight that the Lord is wanting you to come. Maybe submit to him, whatever it may be. Maybe you got a burden, whatever it is, you come as we wait. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, folks are praying. The songwriter goes on and says, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. Too often we sometimes hold off and hang on to things. And how many times have we heard it illustrated? You know, we want to bring something to the Lord. And we come, we bring it to the altar, and then we turn around, pick it back up, take it away with us again. And so I guess we really never did give it to the Lord. We weren't ridding our soul of that, or we wasn't setting it aside. We need to think about that. And uh, don't, don't bring it and then cling on to it, you know, take, take it with you, but wait and uh, let the Lord uh, help you, as we heard tonight, with that extra grace, 
He says, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about. I'm sure most of us have had times when Brother Decker was talking about uh, the Lord out there on those storms and and uh, sometimes those experiences that we go through and it seems like we're being tossed about. We think the Lord's forsaken us and the winds are blowing, but boy, He can say, peace be still. Amen. He says, even though I'm tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within and without, sounds like there's a little bit of a craziness going on there, isn't it? He says, O Lamb of God, I come. That's how He wants us to come, just, just as we are. Amen. Come to Him. He goes on in the song here. He says, Just as I am, poor wretched blind sight, riches healing of the mind. Praise the Lord. We need to have our minds to be healed for our thoughts. Philippians says, Think on these things. Amen. We need to get our minds in the right place and healing of the mind. And uh, he, he says, Yea, all I need in thee to find. Well, aren't you glad that the Lord is enough? Amen. He's everything. He's, he's all we need. He is all we need. And He is all in all. And then that last verse says, Just as I am, thou wilt receive. You know, the Lord doesn't expect you to do anything special. Just come. You come. And if you will come, just as you are, He says, thou wilt receive. We'll welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. In other words, when you come to the Lord, you're taking up God on His promise. God's promised. And uh, you believe God, and I think it was Brother Decker said earlier, uh, sometimes uh, we just have to realize that we've got to uh, yield the Lord, and, and, uh, and once we've uh, come to that place where we're in agreement with God, amen, we have to search ourselves and say, wait a minute, and uh, look and see where we're at. And when the Lord says, hey, you're a sinner, and then you have to come to agreement with that. You have to come to the real, realization of, of the of the truth of those things. What does God's word say? And so then, as we come to the realization of that, we realize that hey, I can come. I don't deserve to come. I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm not any worse than anybody else. I just I just know that I'm I, I I'm a sinner, and uh, I can come. And He opens up His arms and says, "If you'll come, whosoever shall call upon the name shall be saved." That's a promise of God. He said, if we who are saved will come, he says, uh, if we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe there's somebody that just needs to rededicate their life to the Lord and serve the Lord and get right with God and do the right thing. Amen. We praise the Lord. If we'll just take up God at his promise. Amen. He says, because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. What a blessing it is when we just take up God at his word. Amen. And he keeps his word too, by the way. He keeps his promises. Praise the Lord. Father, we ask you now that you just take your word tonight, challenge our hearts tonight. Thank you for Brother Decker coming and bringing the word of God tonight. Thank you for the reminder of the wonderful grace of God. Thank you for what you've done. And I know he's just barely touched the surface on what uh, this passage of Scripture has and beholds for us. I pray it would whet our appetite to uh, dig in a little bit deeper and to search your word even more, to uh, enjoy the blessings of your grace. Thank you that we can experience those things and know that it is your grace. Uh, there's times when we, we wonder, uh, as he said, sometimes we, we hear folks say, well, how, how in the world are you doing this, or how do you do that? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind it's the grace of God. We're thankful, Lord, for your goodness. We're thankful, Father, for how that you work. And I pray now that you would just continue to allow your Holy Spirit to bring conviction, comfort us, challenge us, correct us. Help us, Lord, that we would be able to say you are all in all and uh, that that would be sufficient. Father, we pray that you would meet each need here now and we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Brother Decker, for that wonderful message of grace. I'm, I'm, I'm challenged again tonight. Amen. That's a blessing. Um, want to remind you, if you would, stop by Brother Decker's table here in a minute and get uh, a um, pamphlet from the college. I'll give you an opportunity to kind of use it as a prayer card. Brother Josh, you have several prayer cards with you, don't you, Brother? All right, so please get the prayer cards off of Josh and Rebecca for their family. And uh, we will be having them come back. I already asked him earlier, uh, sometime in the fall, they're going to be kind of traveling in and out the area, uh, you know, before they have to head back to Papua New Guinea. 
and we'll have them in for a Sunday and uh, have a time to fellowship and rejoice. Kids, you did a great job singing tonight. Uh, I want you to sing again the next time, okay? Just plan on coming. You say, when are we going back to Brother Many Pennies? And uh, Dad can tell you, and you practice up some more songs, and you'll be able to sing for us, amen? And, uh, and, and if I know you're coming ahead of time, uh, we'll even make arrangements to have Pizza Joe's all set up for us, amen? How do you like that? We'll, we'll, ha we'll have to do a Pizza Joe's. You guys probably don't like pizza, though, do you? No, I didn't think so. You guys don't like any pizza. I don't know. Abigail's down here going. <laughs> she's she's uh, wiping her lips down here already. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Here's what I'd like for you to do also. Uh, Joe, could you help me real quick? Let's do this. Why don't you come real quick? Let's uh, grab this offering plate down here. Okay. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I guess we could do that. Sure. Okay, we're going to sign off. Those of you that are live streaming with thank you for joining with us. Uh, we're going to uh, encourage you to be with us on uh, Sunday. We've got so many wonderful testimonies we'll share with you on Sunday of camp and the various things that are going on, other prayer requests that are needed, and, uh, and we'll be uh, joining with us back here Sunday morning. I believe Brother Tim uh, is planning on being here uh, for Sunday school, teaching in the morning. We're going through the book of Ezekiel. So do that. Also, that reminds me, he asked a prayer for the family from Idaho that's moving into the area. They're prayerfully considering what to do, trying to get a U-Haul truck. It's hard to find any. The problem of it is they're all leaving California and going to Texas. Or there to the Carolinas or whatever. So it's costing anywhere from two to $2,500 to $2,500 to get a U-Haul leaving California. But if you happen to be in Texas and you're going that way, it won't cost you $500 because they, they want to get U-Hauls back the other way because everybody's wanting them to get out of, out of Dodge. Amen. So they're having a hard time in Idaho getting a U-Haul to move from Idaho this way. So pray about that if you would. I know Brother Tim has been working on some things and uh, you can keep that in prayer too. All right. All right. God bless y'all and uh, we'll, we'll join you back here on Sunday morning. Amen. Very good. Thanks, Joe.